a very, very, very special welcome to each and every one of you that is either tuned in today and are here with us today. I absolutely love walking into a new group and hearing the stories ahead of time about why are you here? And I've asked many people that as they walk in the door. Why did you come to this presentation about vitamin D and prevention? And almost to a person, I hear some of the most heartrending kind of stories, which is like, my daughter has multiple sclerosis and we just heard something about vitamin D. Or I have breast cancer. Or I had some kind of cancer. And this looks like it might help. I'm here to tell you it helps. And we have put together a major public health action program called D-Action to help get the word out about how it helps through education and blood testing and follow up with health surveys. So there is so much to learn and I'm just absolutely delighted to be here to share this public health program with you. And along with my presentation, which will be a little bit about the history of the organization and what we're doing and part of my answer to the is it true that you see on that very first slide there, we're also going to have the pleasure of having Dr. Cedric Garland who is a professor at the University of California, San Diego School of Medicine and also with the Moore's Cancer Center. For those of you who've had cancer, and even those of you who have not, but who've had very loved ones who have had cancer, I want to indicate a few things that have brought us here thus far. I was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2005. The cancer was bad enough, but then I had the treatment for cancer. I had a mastectomy. I had chemotherapy, which permanently damaged some of my body. I had radiation until I bled. And all of this led me to an intense desire to find a better way. Through my skills, my husband's skills, my son who's a researcher, and all of these marvelous scientists that I have now met with vitamin D, it became very clear that, oh my gosh, there's a way out there, and that way is called prevention. In 2007, in May, there was a spectacular seminar sponsored by the National Cancer Institute, a two-day seminar where they had researchers from all over the world presenting what they knew about vitamin D and cancer. I was privileged to attend that seminar. And I sat there and listened for two days at everything people knew, everything from experiments with mice models uh, to uh, petri dishes to human beings and what we know and what we didn't know. And while there certainly was a lot that we don't know, and there still is, there was so much that was known that at the end of the day, on the second day, after hearing all of these people talk and they were talking about what to do next, I couldn't sit still any longer. We had these beautiful microphones that were sitting on our desk and they had little buttons on the end of them which you could push if you wanted to speak. And after my heart stopped beating for a few minutes because I knew I had to ask a question, I punched that button. And I ask a question which truly has changed my life and I honestly hope the lives of already thousands of people. I said, how are you going to get the message out? And there was kind of a silence in the room because that wasn't the topic of the session. These were a group of very spectacular researchers. The get the message out is generally a different group of people. <laughs> At any rate, right after the seminar, I probably had a third to a half of the room come around me and say, how do we help? And all of a sudden it dawned on me that we had this spectacular scientific knowledge without a sales team. Well, we then spent, we, my husband and I, Leo Baggerly, uh, who is a retired physicist now turned vitamin D researchers, spent the next three months traveling the country meeting with the vitamin D researchers all over the United States and in Canada to find out what's the message? What do we need to convey to people in order to help them deal with this vitamin D deficiency and get rid of it? And the most beautiful thing of all happened, it couldn't quite happen, but as many of you have read or you see from time to time in the news media, there's this ongoing discussion about what dosage should I take? Well, first of all, it's the wrong question. You're never going to get a consensus when you're asking the wrong question. And the reason it's the wrong question is because 
it's like many other things. It's like asking, well, how much food should I eat? Well, it depends on your body size. It depends on your weight. It depends on your age. It depends on how much you exercise. Exactly the same is true with vitamin D. It depends on where you live in the country, what your skin color is, how much time you spend out in the sun. So there will never be an answer to what's the dosage. On the other hand, we now have a scientific panel of 30 very respected scientists from all over the country who have said, I agree on what the blood serum level ought to be. And given that, as the core message, we have put together a public health program which has many parts. What I'd like to do right now is run through some slides for you to give you a background of this basis for recommendations. Again, the recommendation that they all have agreed on is the 40 to 60 nanograms per milliliter. And if you happen to be in Canada or many other parts of the word, world, people talk about nanomoles per liter. So that's the same as 100 to 150 nanomoles per liter. And even without measuring your serum level, if you walked into the grocery store, the drugstore, and started taking 2,000 IU a day, they said that's safe. I wanted to show you a beautiful chart that I have always liked for putting things in perspective. The perspective is, how do we know what that 40 to 60 nanograms per milliliter is? Where does it come from? If you take a look at the left side of the chart, that very first red box there is in that 40 to 60 nanograms per milliliter range. And that is what is called a box for the old world primates, the monkeys. The next one, which is also in that range, a little narrower, is the lifeguard level, or at least that's what I call it. For people exposing their full bodies to the sun for a good portion of the day, they also get to that same level. So there is a natural set of information or a natural experiment, if you want to call it that, that gives us that set of information and comfort level saying that's the right level. That winter at 43 degrees north latitude, Reinhold Wieth, one of the researchers up in Canada, said that was the measure in my lab of his people. And you can see how low that is. And yet we have seen words that say that's normal. It is not normal. By giving 1,000 international units a day, it pushed it up a little bit, about 10 nanograms per milliliter. And by giving 4,000 IU a day, that box on the right, it only got it up to about 32 to 34 nanograms per milliliter. So already you see, if you happen to live in Canada, you're probably going to have to take a lot more vitamin D than somebody who spends a lot of time out in the sun. This slide, I want you to pay attention to left and right. Don't worry about the details on the chart. You can download it and look at the details later. From left to right, the serum levels increase. So something that you see on the far right of the chart has a higher serum level than that on the left. What I want you to focus on right now is that box or that black line at the bottom on the left. That disease that's represented on that is rickets. What you see there is how much vitamin D it takes to prevent rickets. Every other disease that we will be talking about is to the right of that black line. That black vertical line there is 25 nanograms per milliliter. The North American population is generally below that level. So you can see what a deficiency we have, and not only the deficiency, the diseases that just flat aren't prevented because our serum levels are so low. The very first red box at the top of that chart there is about all cancers. And that happened to be a very spectacular randomized clinical trial conducted by Joan Lappy of Crichton University. And the level there is at 38 and only 38 nanograms per milliliter, there was a 35% reduction in the incidence of all cancers. That's primary prevention. That's, it didn't happen. That is a powerful number. And she, in her trial, back again to dosage levels, was only giving them 1,100 international units a day. Just imagine what it would be if the levels of those particular people were really pumped up to the 40 to 60 nanograms per milliliter. On this also, I drew this heavy black line there to show you that's 30 nanograms per milliliter. And that's generally what's been accepted as okay. And the okay has to do with bone health. And it is okay with bone health. 
The 40 to 60, I want to show you where it sits. There it is. And it brackets those diseases and the information we currently have at hand about what it takes to prevent them. I would encourage you to download this chart from our website and take a look at the details on it. The next major question I get questions about all the time is toxicity. <gasps> My doctor, somebody said, I can't take it or I shouldn't take too much because it's toxic. Here is a graph showing the results of a study done by John Hathcock and others. The horizontal bar represents toxicity at a serum level measure and it says there was no toxicity below 200 nanograms per milliliter. And remember, our scientist panel is recommending 40 to 60. If you measure it and pay attention, there is no need to be concerned about toxicity. By following the recommendations, we really expect a level of decrease in the incidence of these key diseases breast cancer, type 1 diabetes, multiple sclerosis, and colon cancer of 67 to 70 percent within five years. If you spread the word today, got yourself tested, and started getting your vitamin D levels up, we would have a changed country. I want to show you some just examples of studies. Back again to the, is it true? I asked that question when I first started in this. It was too good to be true. So in searching for the information to present to others about whether or not it's true, I want you to know there are a number of control trials out there. These are the so-called gold standard, the randomized clinical trial. There certainly was the one that Joan Lappe did. There's been trials with falls, neuromuscular function, also on blood pressure and influenza, and there are many more. I like charts a lot better. This one was not a randomized clinical trial. It was an observational study done in Canada. But look at this. That red line says the serum level was less than 20 nanograms per milliliter. The green line, it was greater than 30. And what it says is that there was a 50% less chance of recurrence. Now, anybody who's ever had cancer knows that one of the biggest fears you've got is having it come back. Wouldn't it be nice to know by doing something non-toxic and non-disturbing to your system, and oh, by the way, it's inexpensive, it costs less than five cents a day to take vitamin D, that you could actually improve the recurrence rate by as much as 50%. And of course, if you don't get it, you're not going to die of it. The same is true there. This is the LAPI study, and I just want to show you some highlights there from the placebo group to the calcium and D group over the four years, there was a 60% risk reduction in cancer. And if we take out the first year, and the first year was when there were a few people who had cancer, very likely incipient things that just didn't get caught. When those were taken out, there was a 77% risk reduction shown over the course of the study. That's big news. And again, that's the measure. They started at 28 nanograms per milliliter, which again is higher than the average population, uh, certainly in the North American continent. And they only got them up to 38 nanograms per milliliter, which is pretty good. Here I want to show you some other charts. Mostly have been Dr. Garland's work uh, and things that he has done with others. Um, but back again to the, is it true? And we're not going to go over the details. I just want you to look at the pattern. It says there's an 80% risk reduction in the incidence in breast cancer on this one. On this one, based on a different serum level, there was a 50% lower risk with 48 nanograms per milliliter. Another one, a 50% reduction. Another one, 50% at 52 nanograms per milliliter. It doesn't take much to see that each and every one of these goes down with a higher vitamin D level. Here is a meta-analysis of all of those and others as well showing exactly the same trend. And it is very, very clear that we have an issue with breast cancer that is directly related to vitamin D. Other diseases I want to hit lightly, type 1 diabetes. Type 1 diabetes is a disease that almost shouldn't exist. Note on this chart that we see 78 80% reduction in the incidence of type 1 diabetes by only 2,000 international units a day. It is such a shame for it to exist in Finland, 
it actually has increased because they decreased their dosage from 5,000 IU down to 400 IU and their type 1 diabetes incidence quadrupled. We need to prevent that. Falling. Many of you have elderly parents. What happens when people fall? They go into nursing homes. And or what else happens when they fall? They die. The probability that somebody's going to die in the next five years once they have fallen goes up by a factor of two. And it's just because they become immobile and unable to care for themselves. The risk of falling is down by 50% in this study and in other studies it's been as much as 80% because vitamin D affects the muscles, not just the bones. Neuromuscular function, this chart actually goes up. Uh, but what we're measuring here are performance scores. People did better with basic functions of being able to walk and stand up, sit down, and whatever. Blood pressure. Um, this is a quick measurable. We've been talking about diseases like type 1 diabetes or cancer. You don't get to measure those in a year. Vitamin D and blood pressure, on the other hand, you can measure that within a period of six weeks. And this is certainly one of the major, major uh, cost burdens in our society. And this shows uh, from a study by uh, Ed Giovannucci and all at Harvard, a hypertension burden reduction. Note here that it affects men a little more greatly than women for some reason, which we don't yet know, uh, but that's there. Influenza, uh, a funny question was asked by somebody once, they're sort of funny anyway, anybody ever wonder why we get the colds in the wintertime? Well, maybe it just happens to be that we don't get enough vitamin D in the wintertime. Short disease summary, those that we know a lot about, certainly breast cancer, the type 1 diabetes, multiple sclerosis, colon cancer, heart disease, falls and fractures, we know so much about that it's just almost like rock solid stuff saying you need to deal with this. The areas where we still have a lot of missing information, certainly aggressive prostate cancer, endometrial cancer, the lymphomas and lung cancer. Um, there's a lot more to be done there. Again, more research. There's been some marginal things or at least beginning studies on brain development and cognition where they show infants that at the age of 12 months are able to do more cognitive tasks when they have adequate vitamin D, infectious diseases, pain, Pain is one that I have only recently learned is one of those things that's affected in a very short term, in as little as two months on vitamin D. Pain is one of our society's biggest, biggest reasons for doing um, workman's compensation. I can't show up to work because I'm in too much pain. Um, and the pain is, seems to be very much related to one's vitamin D level. Autism, there's research going on that, on depression, mental illness. All of these things can be affected. At this point, Dr. Garland is now going to talk about the whys. I've given you a quick brush of here's all the things that vitamin D can and we believe does impact. Thanks, Carol. We're already beginning to get some useful information from this uh, grassroots health study. The, the volunteers are taking their own blood samples. Um, they're being analyzed and what we're finding is that even in very health aware people, about half are deficient in the amount of vitamin D they need in their blood to remain healthy and avoid cancer and other serious diseases. Uh, and uh, at the same time, we're learning that approximately half are already at 40 to 60 nanograms per ml. This population is much more likely to be at these high levels. And these high levels will give us an opportunity to understand the safety and efficiency of higher levels of vitamin D even now than are currently recommended in the range from 70 nanograms per ml and higher. So it's a whole new opportunity that can be done without a randomized controlled trial that may come later. But for the moment, this is a observational study that is going to be probably the most powerful tool we have for understanding the effects of self-selected higher levels of serum 25-hydroxy vitamin D. Most of these people are probably getting these high levels from spending five to 10 minutes a day in the sun. A few of them may be doing it by supplementation. It's very difficult to do this from diet. As you might imagine, we get a lot of questions about vitamin D and its ability to prevent disease. And one of the most common ones is, how much vitamin D should I take? 
And uh, you'd think there would just be a, a pat answer to it, but it really depends on your serum 25 vitamin D level. And that you can determine with a test. And then the test serves as the basis for determining what the right amount is. Now, generally speaking, the um, amount of vitamin D in the blood uh, is dependent on the amount of vitamin D that's consumed. So that if you consume, for example, 1,000 international units, your vitamin D in the blood will go up by 10 units. If you t consume 2,000, it goes up by 20 units or nanograms per ml. Um, but the best thing to do is to get the test done, discuss it with a, your doctor, nutritionist, uh, consult uh, an authoritative source, and then select the amount that you're going to take based on that. It'll be a little less if you're getting out in the sun regularly. And as an example, uh, if you decided that you wanted to raise it by 20 nanograms per ml, then you would take 2,000 international units to do it. But in some times and places, you may not need that much. In other areas, you might uh, have to think about uh, getting a little more sunlight, although not more than five to 10 minutes a day to supplement the oral dosage. Another question that we get is, should cancer patients take vitamin D? And we didn't have an answer to this until recently uh, when studies were done that followed the success of treatment and the survival of patients with breast cancer and colorectal cancer. Breast cancer work was done in Toronto uh, by Pamela Goodwin and her colleagues, and the colon cancer work was done in Boston at the Dana-Farber Cancer Center at Harvard by Kimmy Ning and her colleagues. And what we now know is that people that are around 40 to 60 nanograms per ml uh, do twice as well in cancer treatment. They're twice as likely to survive for a decade or so uh, after their diagnosis, half as likely to die, about half as likely to suffer a recurrence. So every cancer patient should be taking vitamin D. There's now uh, almost no reason to uh, not take it. There are 10 mechanisms of favorable action, including a, a, what's called a pro-apoptotic effect, which is uh, an effect that would benefit, potentiate the effect of chemotherapy or radiation therapy. Uh, and uh, as part of normal nutritional support, uh, every individual with cancer should have a level of 40 to 60 nanograms per ml in their blood. As with uh, anyone under medical surveillance, people should be tested regularly for their ionized and total serum calcium, just to make sure it isn't going too high, because sometimes in malignancy it does, and we don't want to add to that. But generally speaking, if that test is done, maintaining 40 to 60 nanograms per ml will substantially improve the survival of cancer patients more than anything else that has arisen in the past uh, five decades. Another question that often comes up is, how do I get the vitamin D? And for most people, uh, when you measure vitamin D in the blood, what you discover is that it depends on the amount of time they spend outdoors. If it's outdoors in the sunlight uh, during the, the late spring, summer, and early fall, about 10 to 15 minutes a day is enough to make uh, a substantial amount of vitamin D, although 40% of the body has to be exposed. So the person has to be wearing shorts or uh, uh, shorts and a little top in, in a woman and uh, has, has to be out in the sun, ideally walking around or moving for 10 to 15 minutes a day. And that only works between the hours of about 11 a.m. and 1 p.m. At other times of the day, there's too little ultraviolet B in the sunlight to make vitamin D. So for eons, vitamin D has come from being outdoors. But there are other ways to achieve it. If you have a history of skin cancer, for example, or you just don't like being out in the sun, your work prevents it, um, then food is a possible source, and some food contains vitamin D. And there's about 100 international units in a glass of milk. But you'd need to drink 10 glasses of milk to get 1,000 units, 20 to get 2,000. So you'd be drinking uh, quite a lot of milk in order to achieve this uh, objective with food alone. So for many people, supplements is the answer. Um, vitamin D3 supplements, known as cholecalciferol, you take the amount necessary to achieve the serum level of 40 to 60 nanograms per ml. And it's a, uh, it's a matter of checking and rechecking the serum to be sure that you get to the level that's effective in disease prevention. Now there are a few uh, contraindications to taking vitamin D. Uh, or adverse interactions. And one of these is vitamin A. And uh, many of the, the products that people buy to get their vitamin D contain substantial amounts of vitamin A. And unfortunately, vitamin A and D use the same 
receptor. It's known as the vitamin A and D heterodimer receptor. And if vitamin A gets on board, vitamin D has a hard time getting on board, and the effect of vitamin D is diminished. It's competition at the receptor level. So you want to keep your vitamin A intake below 6,000 international units a day. Um, it's just not necessary to take a high amount of vitamin A. It actually is counterproductive. Um, cod liver oil, unfortunately, contains both vitamin A and D, so you can't really get to effective levels for cancer prevention, or it's nearly impossible with vitamin uh, A interfering with the effect of vitamin D, which occurs in cod liver oil. So you're looking for something that contains only vitamin D3, cholecalciferol, uh, as long as you're at the uh, usual intake level of vitamin A. A thousand international units a day really would meet those requirements. If you have a granulomatous disease, tuberculosis or sarcoidosis, sometimes those diseases result in a high vitamin D level in the blood of a potent metabolite known as 125 vitamin D. And uh, most people who have these diseases are well aware of them. And if you have them, you shouldn't change your vitamin D intake or your intake of calcium without consulting your doctor. In some cases, it may be possible to do it. In others, it would be contraindicated, meaning that we just can't, we can't have you taking vitamin D if you have a very active granulomatous disease. This affects only a very tiny proportion of the population, less than one-tenth of one percent. Another question that I get often is, should I be tested for vitamin D? And well, the answer is, of course, absolutely. You need to establish what your baseline level is. Uh, it, you're in the dark without the test, and the test tells you how much vitamin D you're going to want to take to get just the right amount of serum 25 hydroxy vitamin D. Uh, normally, you don't want to delay. You should, I think everyone should test as soon as they become aware of the uh, message that we have. Uh, but then it's probably wisest to test in March of each year because that's the point where the vitamin D level is lowest. And most of the damage done by vitamin D deficiency is in those late winter and early spring months when the vitamin D is a, in very short supply. We metabolize, according to Dr. Robert Haney and his colleagues, almost 5,000 international units a day of vitamin D. So we go through it quite rapidly and we're very depleted by March. And that's the point of the year where it's best to test and in that way you'll determine what your low is and make sure that you address that. Uh, and this should become a lifelong thing that you check on your vitamin D annually in March just to be sure that because of changes in your lifestyle, how busy you are, whether you're outdoors, uh, you don't let the vitamin D fall to a precarious level that will put you at high risk of cancer. It's completely avoidable. Thank you very much. We hope you learned something more about vitamin D that will inspire you to, to seek more information about it. It's a burgeoning field. There's a lot to learn. Thank you. Thanks again to each and every one of you for coming and for listening today. We hope that you have found enough to do, not just to learn new things, but actually to take action. And of course, the final slide or the final whatever of any show is to say, what am I supposed to do? And then what you're supposed to do is to get your serum level measured. And ideally, we'd like to invite you to sign up for our D-Action study. And the website there is listed, joindaction.org and get your serum level adjusted to the 40 to 60 nanograms per milliliter range and spread the word. We could literally solve this problem in the United States in one year if each person only spread the word to two other people and kept it going. So spread the word and enjoy and thank you so much for coming.